fantastic and so enjoyable from the, uh, from the, I say a hobby, but it's not really a hobby in numismatics, it's a, I use the word avocation really, something that drives us all. Our first speaker today is uh, Stephen Appleton. Stephen's known very well uh, to us all, um, a dear friend to uh, everybody in the world of numismatics in Queensland and more extensively. Stephen is the president of both of the Queensland branch of our Australian Numismatic Society, as well as the president of the Queensland Numismatic Society. So twice every every month, Stephen uh, uh, looks after us all in Brisbane in those two for forums. Uh, Stephen, in his other life, is a uh, senior scientist. He's uh, an analytical chemist. He uh, works in the uh, University of Queensland in the School of Agri uh, Agriculture and Food Science where he uses uh, unbelievably advanced technology to analyse the content of all specimens that are submitted to the, uh, to the university, food, <coughs> soil, uh, and, and all, all, all specimens. Um, Stephen's well known uh, indeed for in other works of uh, other areas. Stephen is uh, Secretary of uh, Baptist Church in Brisbane. And, uh, but we all know him as a, a go-to person for his encyclopedic knowledge on a whole range of historical stuff. But today, Stephen Appleton is going to be talking about, uh, as you can see, uh, Portuguese coins and their 20th century, 20th century coins in the earlier Portuguese colony. John, Stephen Appleton's late father was a professor and a recipient of the Order of Australia. Wonderful, oh. wonderful. Big thing, Scott. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, just, just to highlight the genesis of this talk was at the um, Anders Show. I think I've mentioned to some people, but not necessarily everyone. Um, at, at the Anders Show in Brisbane, we usually have a competitive display um, with all the with the three main clubs in Brisbane. Uh, everyone is welcome to take part. Um, I brought a display along this year, uh, but I was only one of three, so they decided not to have a display competition this year. <laughs> um, so I thought, well, I went to all the effort of doing this display, so I might as well bring it along here. Uh, and since I'm bringing it along, I might as well give a talk about it. So that's what's happening now. Okay. Um, all right, 20th century coins of the Portuguese colonies. Portugal was one of the great, earliest great European powers in the age of expansion and colonization. Uh, we've all heard of the Treaty of Tordesillas, 1494, and the somewhat less uh, well-known Treaty of Zaragoza in 1529, which divided the unknown world into Spanish and Portuguese spheres. That no other nation was considered worthy of becoming a signatory of this treaty speaks volumes to the degree in which other nations were actively colonizing at the time. They weren't. Um, now, the outcome of these two treaties was in turn a clear indication of the comparative might of Spain and Portugal at the time. Uh, Portugal was granted the known wealth of Africa, Spice Islands, um, okay, all this stuff was known. They didn't know that, but all, all this stuff was known, and, and they knew there was wealth there to be had. Uh, Spain, on this side of the line, they had that was all that was known. <laughs> uh, they thought there might be more there, but they didn't know. So, so, so it, it was very much a gamble on Spain's part, but you know, Portugal considered itself the clear winner of, of this treaty, and being given sole right um, to everything uh, on their side of the line. Okay. Uh, as for actually holding on to the territory granted it by treaty, Portugal was less than successful. Colonies and trade ports were established in Africa, India, and the Moluccas, plus, of course, the tiny slice of South America that was on their side of the line, which eventually evolved into Brazil. Portugal's first coins for its colonial empire were struck in Goa, in India, from around 1520. Portuguese Indian coins um, were locally struck up from the mid-1800s. They were Portuguese in design, but very Indian in fabric and execution. Uh, all of these coins I just stole off the internet. I don't have any of those. I, I have one of these. It doesn't look anywhere near as nice uh, <laughs> um, because it's made of tin and, and tin coins in the tropics just don't last very long. Um, the government also struck coins for Portuguese Ceylon in the 1600s. Colonial coinages for Angola, 1693, and Mozambique, 1725, were struck in Portugal. 
Uh, Brazil used countermarked coinage until uh, local coinage commenced in 1695 after the first Brazilian gold rush. But there was at, that, at this time no unified empire-wide coinage system. Portugal's decline as a colonial power was the result of a combination of the rise of other <coughs> European colonial powers, Britain, France and the Netherlands, as well as the Danes, and the catastrophic destruction of most of the Portuguese fleet in the Great <coughs> Lisbon earthquake and tsunami of 1755. Brazil was lost to the Portuguese colonial empire when it was granted in independence in 1822. Portugal became a republic in 1910, with Portugal itself and most of the colonies adopting a decimal uh, currency system of 100 centavos to the escudo. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is um, what the Portuguese colonial empire looked like uh, in the 20th century. So, uh, curiously, the coat of arms of Portugal remained unchanged in the transition from monarchy to republic. Uh, the coat of arms of Portugal having at its centre a cross of five small blue shields, each with five white dots on them. This symbol is medieval in origin, with the orientation of the shields and the number of white dots in each varying, until finally settling to the current form in 1481. As this form we see on the obverse of the larger denomination coins of the colonies, as well, of course, on the coins of Portugal itself. My favourite origin story of the, um, the, the, the cross of five shields is that the first king of Portugal, Alfonso I, had as his coat of arms a blue cross on a white shield. Like that. This was back when coat of arms were literal, literally coats of arms. There were colourful cloths wrapped around the shield and armour to identify friends from foreign battle. Alfonso I was a warrior king, fighting against both the Andalusian Muslim Caliph and other Christian kings who refused to recognise his right to rule. When Alfonso died, his son and heir, Sancho I, inherited his battle shield. Battered and scarred, the blue cross was in tatters, with scraps of blue leather held on by silver nails. Sancho adopted this damaged shield as his personal symbol, and the rest is history. So, in 1933, uh, the fascist-leaning government of the Estado Novo under the di dictator Antonio Salazar was established. As part of the rebranding in 1935, the colonial empire was given new symbols, and the empire-wide coinage reforms were a single model of coinage design used throughout the remnants of the empire. Uh, just a reminder, whoops. Okay, so uh, this is what the colonial empire looked like in 1935. Um, just a few scattered bits, um, got a few bits of Africa, um, Macau over there in Asia, East Timor, uh, a couple of tiny bits in India, and that's it. Each one of these colonies was issued with their own coinages, all minted in Lisbon from 1958, all with a unified design system. Uh, central to the design of the new coinages were the colonial coats of arms on the reverse. These coats of arms were in turn uh, designed as a uniform series of symbols. Each colonial coat of arms had three main design elements. Um, not just skip over there, uh, just to use Angola as an example. Uh, so on the left, in the position of preeminence, is the five blue shields of the coat of arms of Portugal. Beneath is a pattern of green waves, representing the overseas nature of the colony. And finally, on the right, is a symbol chosen to represent the colony itself. Uh, so, looking at each of these um, colonies in turn, in, in alphabetical order. Uh, we have Angola, which is on the western coast of southern Africa, including the small exclave of Cabinda. Angola was the Portuguese name for the entire coast of southwest Africa. The colonial symbol on the coat of arms is an elephant and a zebra, which is quite appropriate um, for an African colony. Uh, the post-colonial coinage uh, has mostly been issued uh, under the communist backed regime. Uh, which employed typical communist symbolism. It's perhaps good that Angolan coinage no longer depicts elephants and zebras, as both of these animals are now largely extinct in Angola. Uh, due mainly to the deprivations of the decades-long civil war, seeing most of the wildlife decimated. If an elephant steps on a landmine, there's not much left of the elephant. <laughs> uh, after successfully ousting the Portuguese in 1975, the three rebel factions immediately set about fighting each other. Uh, the internationally recognized government opposed independence Angola was in his socialist leaning. 
um, backed by the Soviet Union and Cuba. The UNITA rebel faction that fought the 27 year long civil war was backed by America and South Africa. The political linear of the government shows in the coat of arms typical communist state symbolism, including a machete to symbolize the violence of the revolution. Next colony, Cape Verde. A large archipelago of islands off the westernmost tip of West Africa. The uninhabited Cape Verde Islands have been discovered by Portugal in 1456 and colonized in 1462, which was before the treaty was signed. Uh, as an already established claim, uh, these islands were used as the definition point for the demarcation line in the Treaty of Tordesillas, 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands, the treaty said. Exactly which one of the Cape Verde Islands was supposed to be used as the measuring point, and the, the exact, even the exact definition of a league, uh, were left undefined by the treaty. Uh, they were supposed to send out a joint navigation exploration uh, expedition to, to negotiate all this and find out where this line was and if there were any divided islands. That, sort of thing. that never actually happened, um, but it didn't seem to bother them. Uh, the colonial symbol on the coat of arms for Cape Verde is a carrack, uh, also known as a man of war, a type of warship used by the Portuguese when they discovered the islands in 1456. It is distinguished from the smaller caravel, the type of ship actually used on early voyages of discovery, and having a square sail, as well as the, the, the theme mast sails. Uh, unlike the three larger former, former Portuguese colonies in Africa, Cape Verde did not suffer a long independence war and has not suffered from decades of civil war and economic collapse since independence. The post-colonial coinage bears the emblem of the New Republic. It is the only former Portuguese colony to continue using the old Portuguese denomination, the Escudo. And now that Portugal itself now uses euros, uh, Cape Verde is the only country left on earth to still use currency by that name. Macau, a tiny enclave in China. It's much smaller than Hong Kong, uh, across the, but it's across the Pearl River Delta from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, first acquired by Portugal in the early 1500s, with a formal lease arrangement with the Chinese imperial government beginning in 1557. Uh, they reneged and back and forth and that sort of thing until eventually signing another treaty. Uh, prior to the establishment of nearby Hong Kong, Macau was the primary gateway port for vessels arriving from Europe and wishing to trade with China. But its importance dwindled as Hong Kong's prestige grew. It was the only piece of the Portuguese colonial empire to be retained by Portugal after the 1975 coup. The, the formal wording of the new arrangement with China was that Macau was, quote, Chinese territory under Portuguese administration, unquote. In accord with an agreement signed with China in 1987 that was modelled on the agreement with Britain and Ho over Hong Kong, Macau was returned to China in 1999, two years after Hong Kong. The colonial symbol on the coat of arms is a Chinese dragon holding a Portuguese shield. Uh, coins featuring this coat of arms design with the dragon were last issued in 1980. Macau's co uh, colonial coinage is unique. Uh, among the colonial coinages in several respects. First, in retaining the local currency unit, the pataka, divided into 100 avos, um, as opposed to centavos and to the escudo. The derivation of the name pataka is obscure. It appears to derive from an Arabic word for a large silver coin. Uh, we do know that pataka mexicana was the Portuguese phrase for the Spanish and Spanish-American dollar. So you could equate pataka with dollar. Uh, the pataka was originally pegged to the Chinese and later Hong Kong dollar at one to one, but with monetary reforms of 1935, it was pegged to the Portuguese escudo at a rate of five and a half escudos to the pataka. Uh, the rate was changed on numerous occasions in an effort to keep the pataka close in value to the Hong Kong dollar. Actual coins for Macau were not struck until 1952. Uh, prior to this, provincial coins from China circulated alongside Hong Kong coins. Um, the second unusual feature about these coins is that the um, only coin in the series, or the, the only coins in the colonial series, with a language on it other than Portuguese. Having Chinese symbols on it uh, being the denomination, in, in this case, one dollar, and the Chinese name of the territory, our men. And this was the name which the small archipelago of islands upon which Macau was built was originally known as. The name Macau derives from a misunderstanding by the original Portuguese discoverers. They asked the locals what the name of that place was. Uh, the locals thought they were talking about the temple on the hill behind. 
Um, so they answer that's the Temple of Ma, which is Macau. Uh, and so the duly wrote the wrong name down and it stuck. <laughs> Um, the third unusual feature is, of course, that we see the, colonial, the continuation of the currency after Portugal was no longer in control. As a uh, special administrative region of China, coinage of the local currency, the Vataka, has continued under Chinese rule. The final series of coins issued under Portuguese administration issued from 1992 lacked the colonial coat of arms and other colonial symbols, and these designs remain in use today, uh, having been pre-approved by the mainland Chinese government. Next colony, Mozambique. Situated on the east coast of Southern Africa, it was more properly known as Portuguese East Africa, although everyone, including the coinage, called it Mozambique. Uh, this is actually the name of a tiny island just offshore, upon which the Portuguese built their first trade fortress and resupply base in the Indian Ocean in 1507. There's a chapel on the island, built in 1522, that is touted as being the oldest European building in the Southern Hemisphere. The fortress on Mozambique Island was named Fort São Sebastiano, and this name is carried across indirectly onto the post-1958 coinage. Uh, the colonial symbol on the coat of arms is a clutch of seven arrows, the symbol of Saint Sebastian. Uh, the legend of this particular saint is that he was a soldier in the army of Roman Emperor Diocletian. When the emperor discovered he was a Christian, he had Sebastian tied to a tree and shot with mother bolt arrows. Uh, this didn't kill him. Uh, he was nursed back to full health. He then went uh, to the Emperor Diocletian and confronted him over his sins in persecuting Christians. Uh, and he was then uh, promptly clubbed to death. <laughs> it seems kind of ungrateful to the people who nursed him back to hell. I don't know. <laughs> um, so St. So Sebastian is always depicted with arrows, either holding a clutch of arrows, as in that medieval picture there, or in, in the posture of being shot full of arrows. Uh, the European the Renaissance and later artists love painting him. Uh, in that attitude with arrows all stuck in him. Um, <laughs> St. Sebastian's arrows were actually the second form of the coat of arms. The pre-1935 arms originally assigned to Mozambique uh, depicted an armorally sphere, and this version of the arms can be seen on the pre-1935 coinage. Not sure why they changed it. Perhaps the sphere as a badge of the Portuguese Empire as a whole was considered too generic. The post-colonial history of Mozambique mirrors closely that of Angola, decades-long civil war with a socialist-leaning official government, uh, including the AK-47 rifle uh, on the flag and coat of arms. <coughs> Although the end of the civil war has brought peace and stability, it remains one of the poorest and least developed countries in Africa. In 1995, Mozambique applied for and was admitted to membership in the Commonwealth of Nations, the former British colony, uh, which is the first member not to have a history as a former British colony. Portuguese Guinea, a small territory in far western Africa. Uh, the colonial symbol on the coat of arms is a gold scepter with a Moor's head at the top. Uh, this is the scepter of King Alfonso V, who was given the epitaph the African following his campaigns in North Africa, and under whose rule Guinea was first colonized by Portugal. I couldn't find a picture of the actual scepter. I don't know if it ever actually existed. That's a picture of the king over there holding a scepter, but it's, it doesn't have a uh, a Moor's head on it. And there is no Moor's head scepter in the collection, in the current collection of the crown jewels of Portugal. It should not surprise that this symbol of colonialism does not appear on coins of post independence Guinea Bissau. Um, unlike Angola and Mozambique, Guinea Bissau did not immediately fall into violent civil war once the Portuguese pulled out, due mainly to the near total control that a single socialist supported rebel faction had over most of the colony uh, at the time. As with most of post-colonial Africa, it has since had several coups and civil wars. Uh, circulating coins of Guinea-Bissau are not easy to find as the country suffered from severe inflation for most of the post-independence period. And uh, it has since joined the uh, West African States Monetary Union so you can no longer get uh, Guinea-Bissau coins and notes. Portuguese India. Portugal was the first European colonial power to arrive in India, and was the last to leave. Unlike Britain, Portugal never tried to advance inland from its initial coastal possessions. By 1935, just three small, or five small enclaves on, on the western coast of India remained. The largest was Goa, with the remainder being just uh, little more than fishing villages. 
colonial symbol on the coat of arms is officially described as a water wheel, though its resemblance to both a Hindu, Hindu chakra wheel and the Christian St. Catherine's wheel is almost certainly not a coincidence. In 1935, the population of the three enclaves was about 50% Christian, 50% Hindu. The second element of the colonial coat of arms is a tower. Although the largest fortress in the colony, Fort Aguada, featured a lighthouse with a passing resemblance to the tower depicted on the coat of arms, I'd be surprised if this was intentional. None of the other coats of arms show any indication that the person designing the arms had ever visited the colonies, nor knew of specific geographical features of those colonies. Up until 1958, Portuguese India had a monetary system that ran parallel to the predecimal standard used in British India, 16 tangas to the rupiah equivalent to the 16 annas to the rupee of the British Raj, with one tanga deemed to be equivalent to 60 Portuguese ray. In 1958, the colony switched to the escudo, and let's say three escudo coin there. Newly independent India was not prepared to tolerate any relic of colonial rule, especially as by 1948, the population of Portuguese India had become majority Hindu. Many of the Portuguese colonists and Christian converts could see the writing on the wall and had fled the enclaves in the previous decades. Territory was annexed by India after a successful invasion in 1961 and was administered as a Union Territory of India until Goa attained full statehood in 1987. No separate coinage was made for the territory following the Indian invasion. Portuguese Timor, comprising the eastern half of the island of Timor to the northwest of Australia plus the exclave of Akusi in the western half. East Timor was the last remnant of Portugal's once vast Southeast Asian territory. The monopoly they held over the Spice Islands was coveted by the Dutch, and the Dutch took full advantage of the disaster of 1755 to claim most of the Indonesian archipelago. The colonial symbol on the coat of arms is the cross of the Dominican Order, which was instrumental in converting the local population to Christianity. Superimposed on this, we find once again one of the little blue shields with five dots. Prior to 1958, Portuguese Timor used the same currency system as was used in Macau, 100 avos to the Bataka, though only smaller coins denominated in avos were issued. The esquilo was introduced with an exchange rate of 5.6 esquilos to the Bataka, meaning that a 6 esquilo coin was roughly equal to the old Bataka. This explains the odd base 3 denominations we find in the Portuguese Timor series. Independent Indonesia was resentful of any colonial enclaves within its sphere of influence. When Portugal unilaterally declared East Timor to be independent, they moved swiftly and invaded the country in 1975. No separate coinage for East Timor was issued after the Indonesian invasion. Our separate coinage would resume on independence from Indonesia in 1991. Post-independence coat of arms of East Timor uh, is the second in this presentation to feature an AK-47 assault rifle. Uh, this symbol uh, has not yet appeared on the coinage though. Uh, East Timor technically does not have its own currency yet. The US dollar is legal tender. But curiously, it does have these currency subunits. The Centavo coins are issued to be on par with the US cent and circulate alongside whatever US coinage happens to arrive on East Timor. Uh, thus, in practice, the currency of East Timor is 100 centavos to the US dollar. St. Thomas and Prince Islands. A uh, small archipelago of two island, uh, island groups in the Gulf of Guinea. Like Cape Verde, these islands were uninhabited when the Portuguese uh, found them in 1471. The island's equatorial climate proved unappealing to Portuguese colonists, so Portugal used the islands as a place, to, place of exile for convicts and as a hub for the slave trade. Uh, looking at just the coins, uh, the colonial symbol on the coat of arms resembles an astrolabe. Uh, or a gnomon or some other navigational instrument. Uh, but that's not what it is, as a view of the colored version of the coat of arms can reveal. It is a horizontal water wheel and is derived from the personal banner of King Alfonso V of Portugal, who I mentioned earlier. The water wheel banner can be clearly seen on the Pastrama tapestries, which were commissioned by the king in 1471 to commemorate his successful campaigns in Morocco. And there's a, a close up of one of the flags um, from the tapestry. Whenever you see that flag, on the tap it's a big complex thing, much more complex than the Bayou Tapestry. And uh, whenever you see that flag, you know, the guy, the guy under it is supposed to be the king. <laughs> it's supposed to be. <laughs> well, well, they're all in case of arms, that's all the difference. <laughs> that's, why, that's why they're carrying the flag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, as, with the, as is the case with Cape Verde, the former uninhabited island status of St. Thomas of Prince seems to have allowed for a far more peaceful and prosperous post-independence existence. Uh, St. Thomas and Prince is widely regarded as one of the most stable democracies in Africa. Post-independence currency is known, unit is known as the Dobro, the Portuguese name for the old gold coin, more commonly known in English as the doubloon. So, to the end of an era. With the rest of the old European powers rapidly decolonizing in the 1950s and 60s, Portugal held out. The right-wing government refused to let go of its empire or its ideology that Portuguese rule brought light and civilization to the benighted natives of the colonies. In 1951, these overseas territories were officially renamed from colonies to provinces, but the patronizing attitudes remain. The Portuguese military suffered a humiliating defeat when India invaded and conquered Portuguese India. And by 1974, all three mainland African colonies, uh, Guinea, Angola, and Mozambique, were embroiled in wars for independence. The Portuguese military was losing. Under the Salazar regime, all young males in Portugal were conscripted into the army for a four-year period, including a minimum of two-year deployment in Africa. Many young men fled Portugal rather than serve, uh, making the army rel reliant more and more on native conscripts, which didn't help. Uh, meanwhile, on the international stage, international sanctions were prescriptions against Portugal as a result of their attitude to decolonization strained the economy to breaking point. In 1974, elements of the Portuguese military, fed up with fighting the seemingly never-ending series of wars in the African colonies, staged a military coup. It was called the Carnation Revolution, because it was mostly peaceful. They overthrew the dictatorial government, beginning a period of turmoil and instability as long repressed underground socialist <coughs> and Marxist groups came out into the open. One year later, the new provisional government unilaterally declared all its remaining colonies, except for Macau, independent and withdrew all colonial troops. Virtually overnight, the 560-year-old Portuguese colonial empire ceased to exist. The only remnants to survive the Carnation Re Revolution and its aftermath were Macau, which was handed back to China in 1999, and the two small archipelagos in the North Atlantic, the Azores Islands and Madeira. These islands were considered integral parts of Portugal, unless were not included, uh, or issued their own coinages in the 20th century. Thank you. Stephen, we're overwhelmed by the scholarship in that, uh, in that wonderful presentation. Thank you. We have time for a question or a comment. Um, Stephen, to Cape Verde, some of us who've flown from Southern Africa to Europe uh, under difficult circumstances have stopped over at Cape Verde, which is a refueling point. It's now an independent nation, is that correct? Uh, um, it, it, it's been independent since 75, when they were mm. all declared independent. Yes. Uh, and it, it, it's been peaceful. Mm. Um, the, the revolutionary movement in Guinea called itself the Revolutionary Movement for Independence for Guinea and Cape Verde. You know, big, long acronym. Yes. <laughs> mm. uh, um, but, but this was apparently done without Cape Verde's knowledge or consent. Uh, <laughs> they were happy being colonies of, colonists of Portugal and, and yeah, they, they, they were sort of, sort of thrown to the wolves in 1975, but, but they made the best of it and they, they've been peaceful and prosperous and independent ever since. Um, they have the same problem with boat people that, 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 that Australia has in, in terms of people in Senegal and, and mainland Africa you know, paying thousands of euros to, to get on boats and be shipped. A you know, couple of thousand kilometres across across the Atlantic to to Cape Verde to by, by people people's smugglers. They have that same problem um, because once you're on Cape Verde, you can get, then get in, into the European Union. But, but that's why people are trying to do that. So. Well, Stephen, you've given us a vision actually into a, a wider world, the world of colonialism. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful well, John, one, one, one comment. Oh, I always wondered what the pataka was because it's one of the currencies mentioned that Cook needed in its first voyage for exchange of goods in various places. Now I know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. And on behalf of us all, dear Stephen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 <
It's a privilege now to introduce Colin, of course, again. Uh, we all know Colin very well. Professional new business uh, scholar, historian, polymath, uh, and Colin's going to tell us about uh, some his personal experiences of collectors and collections. Thank you. I'd like to consider the fact that uh, all of you here are great collectors. The fact that you made the effort to come from your respective parts of the world, uh, and join us in a weekend of talking about coins and you know, showing some of your great coins from your own collections will put you in that little elite group of great collectors. So I'm not going to talk about any individual in this room. <laughs> so protect anybody who gets upset and you miss them out or something like that. My uh, discussions uh, with people who I've had personally had encountered with in my adventures around the world for the last 60 plus years. Uh, some of them are people that you know as names. Uh, I seem to know a lot more about some of these individuals than most people normally do, which makes it rather interesting in their own, own way. Whether I can get through much of this in half an hour, I don't know, but let's see what I can do. Um, what's a great collector? A great collector is someone who goes to a lot of trouble to acquire objects, in this case coins, but medals, badges, banknotes, anything in that area. And they do it with some degree of enthusiasm and enjoyment, because after all that's what it's about. Uh, they have a dedication in collecting. They want to talk about their coins, they want to show their coins, and ultimately when their coins are disposed of, as most collectors are, they like to see it portrayed in a way that makes them feel that they've achieved their lifetime goal in doing um, We all have this acquisition desire, uh, some more so than others. Some people are content to collect farthings, others want to collect big coins, some want to collect everything. Uh, and I've had some of my great collectors say, I want to own everything. <laughs> I think that's a broad statement. Uh, Dr. John Vincent Flynn told me that. He wanted to own it all after he has picked out the third same coin that I already had on display at Noble Hispanic. He wanted to buy the three of them. I said, why do you want three of them? He said, I want to own them all. <laughs> so I got that message. Um, who are the types of collectors there are? It's very interesting to analyse collectors. There are some who take their collection and heap it, hold on to it, right till the day they die, and someone else has the opportunity of acquiring it because it's sold at auction. Mark Friegel was one of those people. There are those who sort of have enough wisdom to realise that let's get rid of the coin before we die so we can see what happens to them. <laughs> Owen Fleming was like that, uh, and, and so was uh, a number of other great collectors that I can nominate to. Um, there are those collectors who like to change their collection. They collect an area, take control of it, feel they know it very well, and then get rid of it. Rod Sill's a bit like that. <laughs> and I'm a bit like that too. But at the same time, you don't let anything really go. You hang on to things, but maybe you'll get back to it and get involved in it again. So, you know, I've acquired so many coins, and I think to myself, another hundred years I'll have it sorted out. <laughs> we don't have that time. So who were the great Australians that I know that comprise the great collectors. The first great Australian collector I ever encountered was the first significant post-war collector. That was Sid Hagley. Sid Hagley was a South Australian, and I remember going there with Mark Freehill and Jim and Ken Welsh, who was at one time the president of our society in the early 60s, to his house at Renmark in South Australia. And he had a collection of coins in cabinets that went across the whole of the room and he trades all the way down. I thought, this is a collection. This man is a great collection. Well, unfortunately, uh, it got dispersed. Max Stern acquired this collection and sold it off, and everyone had a bit of it in one way or another. They bought those coins from Max Stern. <coughs> but he had great coins. I remember I was very fortunate. He had two Alfred the Great London monogram pennies. They had one with a hole in it. So he, let me, he sold me that one. He wasn't keen to sell coins. He let me have one of those ones that he had two. So it's, uh, he was 
our, probably our first grade collector that really stood out that I had personal encounter with. The other one that made great significance was Gilbert Heidi. Gilbert Heidi was a pastime president of our Australian Interstate Society, and he was a, uh, a fearsome collector in some respects. He, I had the opportunity of cataloguing all his coins. He collected collections in some respects. One of the great collections he acquired was one owned by a man called Elliot Smith, who was at one time curator of numismatics part-time at the Australian Museum back in the 50s and 60s. And he must have got close to the end of his life and he decided to sell his collection and Gilbert came along and said, I'll buy the lot, which he did. And uh, he also collected tokens. And he was fanatical about Australian tokens. And he felt that there was one man's collection he had to have. And it took a while for him to negotiate. First he bought his own collection, he had his own collection. Then he bought the Marcus Clark collection, which was a big collection of tokens. Marcus Clark was a big uh, store manager, or store owner in Sydney, that uh, owned a big building and sold good wares and so forth. And he was one time, I think, I may have spoken to some people here, uh, sort of like the president or patron of the Australian Hispanic before the series of patrons which is still with John at the moment. So that was uh, collecting of tokens. Then he had to get the other collection, the one that stood out alone, Sid Hagley. So he had to buy Sid Hagley. So he finished up with more tokens than anyone else in Australia. Uh, so he had Sid Hagley's collection, he had Marcus Clark's collection, he had his own collection, and he was buying other ones that turned up Padre Bremers and, uh, and so forth like that. Well, we sold all those, as most of them anyhow. Uh, I catalogued them all and sold them in grey auctions back in 1971, 72. And I know, talking about Sid, uh, sorry, Gilbert, why he wanted to get rid of his coins was the fact that he felt that you know, he wanted money because he had a new business venture going, or mod apps. And uh, he sort of felt he needed this capital backing. So he got that capital backing by selling his coins. And at the time those who went to, like you went to one of those sales, it was a bigger bet back in the early 70s. It was a noble sale of the 70s. Gilbert got unfortunately tied up with a, a wrangle over the 1909 two shilling piece, Australian two shilling piece. And those who have read the the account of uh, the infamous David G and his wanderings and so forth, your feet it fits in well now. We often think to ourselves, myself particularly, and Ray also, because when Adler, who had the coin, paid ten thousand dollars for it back about 1968 or something other for it, 69, said, "How do I get it verified that it's genuine?" And uh, Dion Skinner, who sold him the agent for the coin said there are only three people in the country you should talk to, Ray Jewell, Bob Pitchfork, or Gilbert Heidi. I believe he rang me, I wasn't in the office, thank God. Neither was uh, Ray available at the time, and he got Gilbert Heidi. So for a misery $400, Gilbert went to a painstaking effort of describing this coin exactly, with every bump, knock, whatever, but turned out all different to the one that actually Adler had. Because what he described probably was a genuine one. What he had, he got it, was a reproduction made by David G. But the real problem was basically that uh, it was deemed a forgery some years later. So Adler sued Heidi for false representation on his report. But $10,000 later, now mind you, the government only got $400, but it cost him $10,000 to get out of a problem, which he didn't need to get into in the first place. So by the grace of God, they extract that particular problem. Moving on, who were the other great collectors? Well, other great collectors was uh, Owen Fleming, one time president of Australian Minister Society. Owen was the <coughs> first person I actually met who was president when I joined the society back in June 1960. And uh, Owen obviously must have taken a took a liking to me because the rules in those days were simply, thou shalt be put on notice for two months before you can become a member. In other words, put your application in, just wait a month, any objections about him joining? Another month, we'll have a vote on it, and if that was okay, you accepted. Well, towards the end of the meeting, he said, I sort of put an application, he said, I think we'll vote on it now. Anyone object? Right, he's a member. <laughs> so <laughs> I was the first one I did it, I went through the two months process. I don't know what I did to achieve that, maybe you knew about it. But anyhow, that was Owen Fleming. Owen unfortunately had a bad experience, he had a robbery in his home, uh, a lot of his good coins were stolen, and that broke his heart a little bit. 
So he decided a bailing out. So he came and approached me, well, I sell them at auction, I catalogued them and sold them. There's one regret that the few months, few days later, as the Australian Democratic Society meeting, and everyone went from the society, went to the auction, of course, to see how it's coins being sold. They have a beautiful holy dollar and dumps and all the rest of it. Nice collection of Australians, but a lot of them were stolen, as you mentioned. And he was so disappointed that no one bought along any of the coins they bought at the auction to show, at the show and tell bit at the end of the uh, meeting. And he said, no one seemed to appreciate the coins they sold, they bought at the auction. They didn't want to tell people about it. You know? <laughs> There's a moral in that story somewhere. If you buy things from someone who's recently around, who's still around, show his coins off. He wants to know that you like it. You know, that's the reason why you show it. Owen is why we still have an A&S. That's right. Well, Owen that's, that's another story, though, which we all know about, because yeah. he was the one member who was still a member of society with Ron Byatt back in the original Australian Space Society back in the 30s. And uh, we were put into recession for six, seven years. Uh, another society came involved, the Society of New South Wales, the Lip Space Society of New South Wales. And uh, he reactivated the joining them together, becoming the Australian Space Society again. Anyhow, that's another story. That's not part of the story today. Owen Fleming. Um, probably leads me to talk about briefly about Tom Hanley. Tom Hanley's collection was rather an extraordinary collection. We all know Tom, or those who have been around a few years. Uh, he was sort of like uh, like Rod Day, the secretary for 50 years, <laughs> and played the role and kept the society together. And he was an interesting collector. Uh, maybe you don't know, but he had his collection in a, shall we say, a converted refrigerator, which he put shells into it and somehow locked it up, and that was his store chest of all his treasures. <laughs> he had a big library. The library, if you're ever interested to see it, is still available to see in Jim Noble's office, all bound in boxes against the wall where you do your viewing. He has never opened them up <laughs> after the sale. He bought the box and then <laughs> did anything with it. It's still there. Um, I bought his stamp collection and I only looked at it the other day. There's two or three volumes he had on Australian stamps. And he meticulously wrote everything up. It was very neatly all addressed to Tom Hanley and his, his address and Karen Bar. He was a serious collector. He loved his coins. And I think that's a feature about anyone who's a serious minister. Collector. Other mentions I should make is Ray Jewell. Ray Jewell is an extraordinary collector who took me into his house, showed me his collection. He subsequently sold his collection through Max Stern because of the fact that he joined up with Max Stearns and felt he should sell it. Now what impressed me was the first time I saw 29 holy dollars on one tray. <laughs> <laughs> he owned them. Uh, he was a big collector of, of holy dollars. Outside of Dixon, of course, there's 53 across the road that was made in the Dixon. So that's where they are located. Now, the 29 holy dollars, I think I finished up owning about seven of those ones that he actually had on his display. Uh, that enthused me to get a holy dollar. And when he sold his coins, I did all sorts of things to get at least a couple of them easy. You know, sold him some coins. Rare 1794 US set that was today worth probably be close to 100,000. I let him have that for 50 pounds to get the 300 pounds up to buy a holy dollar. <laughs> Anyhow, that's another story too. But Ray Jewell was a great collector and he collected other things. But once he joined Stearns, he stopped collecting. He was an art collector as well. Those extraordinary men we were dealing with at the moment, and still selling his stuff, is Dr. John Vincent Adams Flynn. Now, he used to come to the office and buy coins from him. And uh, because he was crippled, uh, from polio, I believe, in the earlier days, he was a scholar, uh, got a doctorate degree in uh, Indian, Hindu, uh, Parsi languages and so forth, and studying transcripts of the 17th century, way out to the field that most people wouldn't be studying. He became an expert on Indian coins. Uh, but he used to collect ancient coins, Indian coins, Thai, uh, uh, Nepalese coins, and other coins of the world. He was another gentleman who said, I want to own them all, I think I told you earlier. He was an extraordinary collector. I'd bring trays, coins, on a big tray, 60 or 80 coins, on, and he'd be picking them out like this, put them aside, he'd be buying a <coughs> nice tray, a perfect buyer. Yeah. Couldn't whisper. <laughs> Never argue about it, that's it. He wanted the discount if he spent enough money with you, and I always gave the discount, obviously, I wasn't stupid. <laughs> and uh, so he was uh, very fortunate. But he had a, an income which was quite outstanding. Um, we did see one little paycheck of one of his things there probably 30 years earlier, where it was a quarter of a million pound, or a quarter million dollars a quarter, he was getting because of the fact that he was a major beneficiary of the Tattersall's uh, empire. So he never really worked, he just enjoyed collecting. 
He owned 150 uh, Rover cars. He got that to Rover cars, <laughs> 150 of them. He had a massive collection of silverware that took uh, six months for the auction company to sell that. He had 30 or so cabinets of coins, which he bought cabinets imported, especially from Baldwin's in London to his collection. He owned a warehouse, big warehouse, owned the most expensive house in Canberra. Uh, he had a big warehouse where he could fit, feature himself. He had a sort of flat building and everything else. Unfortunately, like all of us, he died. And uh, the solicitor acting for his estate got the coins together and came up in a pan tech. You know, the big trucks that come up and it was filled with boxes of coins. We thought, God, where are we going to put all this stuff? You know, <laughs> not knowing what was in it. Of course, it's turned out to be quite an extraordinary amount of coins of different types. He collected Roman, Greek, a little bit, Byzantine. He collected Indian, Indian coins. He collected Nepalese coins. He collected the coins of the world. He had bagfuls of coins from Nigeria and all these sort of things. It was just an extraordinary collection. Uh, I'm sorry to see him pass on because he was such a good buyer. But uh, in reality, he was a great collector. But he wanted everything. He was one of those going to die with it. He's going to have everything. I asked him, what, what are you going to do with all these coins? I knew he was a single man. And he said, oh, I don't know. I'll give some away somewhere. Well, we never did, of course. In reality, he just he had them all and then they came up for auction and they're still selling them. We're still going to be selling them. There's some in the next sale, here's, and so it goes on. Another person that fits in the same scope in a slightly different way is Mark Freehold. Mark Freehold, we all know and remember because of his interest in banknotes, but he was an enthusiastic collector of British Commonwealth coins and English coins. And much as we are surprised, his collection so far has realised over $2 million for auction. The reality is that uh, he's a single man. He seems to be a phobia for single men to collect coins. <laughs> you know, quick collecting, gentlemen. If you get single, quick collecting. But the reality is that uh, his collection was an important place for collective quality. And the quality paid off. Things which, you know, we sold him. I know they sold for $10 or $15 a week, thousands when they sold him. <coughs> Um, his banknote collection may be surprising, really a great fabulous collection, but you'll never see it. You'll see some of the duplicates of it, but you'll never see the original collection, because that's been given to the British Museum as a place of the big banknote collection. He also left a little money to the society. The guy had sold a house for two million dollars, or one thousand dollars. Yep. I've well, got the check in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you've got the check in. <laughs> yeah, I've got the check. It's in the bank. <laughs> Good. So, I mean, Mark was one of those. Every time I was in, overseas and I was talking to people who died there yesterday, just a couple of years ago, I remember him yesterday. Uh, big time deals. They said, What do you mean, freeloaders dead? Freeloader? Yeah. He used to come and stay at our place for free. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he was looking for a place to stay for free, you know. In reality, he had more money than any of us really could spend enjoying the best hotels. He never did. He wanted to travel around the world and stop that because in the last 10 years of his life, it was in fact he couldn't get around so easy. But he was a great collector. His collection was really a superb collection for what he collected. So he fits into this short group of 20 names. Um, there are many others I could talk about. We're coming up, you'll start to see the great Laurie Sherwin's collection. We talked about him. And yesterday, remember him, Dr. Lawrence Sherwin. Laurie went to moved to Bathurst. Uh, he got married in the last ten years. He was a single man. His collection is quite amazing. Uh, he he was a collector per infinite. He had a big, thick exercise book. Every coin he wrote got a line in his book. There's five thousand six hundred of these lines <laughs> that he written a description in detail what the coin was, what he paid for it, who he got it from, and everything else. So sometimes embarrassing when you look through it, you realize, well, there's mine now. Well, there's mine. Yeah. <laughs> no, he bought things from me. He bought things from nobody. He bought things from probably a lot of people around the place. A lot of the dealers in Sydney, you know, uh, M.R. Roberts, and Dave Tully, and Martin Daniels, and, uh, uh, Dave Allen, all of these people he mentions by name in this book. And he had his own tickets, were little envelopes with the same story, all written all over it again. <laughs> He was the collector for infinite one, because he collected and kept them all. I don't think he ever sold a coin. So that's, you're going to see some of his coins coming up for auction in there, at least they wouldn't just make so. He was a great collector. I'll jump quickly 
Another great bloke I should mention. Well, I, I keep thinking of people. Uh, Jim Noble, whom you think of only as an auctioneer, he's got the greatest collection ever formed of New Zealand medals and medalists. There are three volumes that thick of each one. He's done two so far. He's probably got 10,000. Collection of virtually anything that everything that's been print or sorry, produced in New Zealand on New Zealand medals and medals and medalettes and everything else. It's an amazing collection. He's never seen it completely, neither there's anyone else, but he's had Tony Grant and John O'Connor cataloguing this for the last three years, these collect this collection. So he ranks as a great collector because of what he's acquired. An infant collection of New Zealand medalettes and medalettes, medals and so forth. Um, Another man you've never heard of, but you sometimes see if you're at Noble Lewis Mac, an old Indian man. Byron I run. I asked him last Wednesday, can I use his name? Because I obviously don't want to talk about living people unless they know that I'm talking favorably about them or whatever. Byron Arani is a collector of Indian coins. And I've known him for probably 40, 50 years. Uh, he's, he's a retired doctor. He's about 88 now. Now I remember when the greatest dealer from India Prashant Kulkhani came to Australia and I introduced him and he said, I have met the, I met the man that everyone talks about in India, the great collector in Australia, but no one knew him. <laughs> I said, this is the man. And he, he was overcome by it. And Prashant Kulkhani had, at his daughter's wedding, 15 elephants. <laughs> he lives in a palace <laughs> in, the, uh, in, in Rajapatam area of India. What? He's a very wealthy man, but he paid homage to as a collector, who they, they knew about. They used to talk about him. The dealers would talk about this mysterious Australian that bought their great rarities in condition. Uh, he's selling a coin in the next auction. You may be interested to see. He's 88 and he's still selling coins. Uh, and he's still got a massive collection. But unfortunately, some are stuck in Iran, some are stuck in India, and some are stuck in Australia. But he's selling the uh, zodiacal rupee of Jahangir, who, by the way, is father of Shah Jahan, the zodiacal, uh, zodiacal rupee of Gemini. It's a purpose, it's about 5,000 dollar coin. But if you, make, if you look back through earlier noble sales, he had the gold mowers of the zodiacs that come up for sale as well. But another great collector here in Australia. Now I'll pass over some of the Australian other ones I should mention. Move quickly, how do I get up the time? Only five minutes. I haven't talked that long, have I? Very quickly. Who are the great world collectors? I know VCD, Battle Dimitriani. Rick was shocking, great collectors. He formed Rick. I bought their fest trips here. You know what a fest trip is? Most people don't know. Some people do. Very often fest trips are done for scholars who are considered eminent scholars in their profession area. And fest trip might be done on numismatics, and I've got probably 30, 40 of them. These are a coupling of essays by the leading scholars in the world to honor you because you're such a great scholar. Very rarely it's ever done for a collector. That's Basil Dimitriani's fish trip. That Rick Wachowski's fish trip. Rick Wachowski, both of these, I have probably 1,500 of these coins. Uh, but he's, this is his collection of Roman Republican coins. Auction sale catalog, beautifully bound. That was one of the years he collected. He also collected Kistophoric pieces, which is a book on here. He bought a lot of Kistophoric pieces from me. We collected together. A little story about Rick Wachowski. I don't know. TNG auction, and I had bought a 10 very rare Christopher Tetradimes from an auction heritage which was held on the day before. And I picked it up that morning. And I'm sitting next to Rick, uh, and Rick uh, said, Where what have you got? I said, oh, I've got these 10 very interesting uh, late issue Christopher pieces, and I just paid a thousand dollars for them. And he looked at me and said, Can I have a look at these? I want these. I said, No, you can't have them. Yeah. I, I want them. You really want them? You say, oh, I want, oh, I want to study the dyes. Or I said, I want one, but you can have the rest. Now, what, do you, what did you pay for them? I said, I'll give you $3,500 from that, like your check. I thought, I can't make $2,000 quicker than that. So he <laughs> them. When he died, I come, someone come across, I bought a couple more of them back. <laughs> but what less to be paid. Rick was unusual that he collected a group of about 20 of the best dealers and collectors in the world. He had a special dinner for them at the Rock Restaurant. And he had it with his 
partner, Rick and Heidi's New York uh, Incorporated Dinner, New York in Auction Dinner at the Rock Restaurant, which is the most, presti one of the most prestigious restaurants in New York. <coughs> He'd import the wines, and he had probably uh, 200 bottles of wine imported from France to keep everybody happy. I remember Harlan Burke eventually got invited. Now, Harlan Burke's a big time dealer in Chicago. <laughs> and he knew I used to go to this every year until I was invited. And uh, anyhow, uh, Harlan says, uh, he got along and he said, I've actually made the A list at last. <laughs> <laughs> Harlan's one of the biggest dealers in America. He never got invited, but eventually he got, the list, he got invited. And he'd, he'd invite people. Simon Mendel got invited because he was a leading expert of Byzantine coins. He died, as you know. He lived in England. Uh, Andrew Meadows was invited, uh, former keeper of coins and the deputy director of the British Museum. Who, I can't think of the name. Um, I'll think of the name too. He, he was invited. All the great collectors, he regarded me as the great Australian that should be invited. So I was invited. We became good friends and he bought coins from me. I finished up buying all of them back. In fact, in his Roman Republican coins there, there are silver and bronze, and a few gold coins of course, scattered throughout. The bronze coins, I bought some of the ones out of the auction, but I bought all these duplicates. Four of those two by two boxes you have. I got about five boxes full of these coins from Rick Rashonky's duplicates, which I've yet to have lost. I'm doing that in my old age. So anyhow, he had this special dinner. Uh, he was a great collector. Unfortunately, he died too early. He gave his coins, what was left, to the American Little Space Society. And as a matter of interest, uh, Lucia Carboni produced this book, Christophoric Coins. And she sent me this copy of this book for free. It, gives. it just came out earlier this year, or yeah, late in the last year. Because uh, half the coins are my coins, half the, his, uh, the rest were his coins. And there's pages and pages of photographs of them in the back here. So he used to buy coins from him uh, to fit in his collection because he wanted to have the best in the world. Well, he had the money for it, so it didn't matter. I didn't. I was quite happy to let him have a few of mine. It made a significant thing. I'm running out of time. Um, I should mention people like Larry Adams, who wanted to own every gold coin type that's in Freiburg, and he virtually got there. Dr. Larry Adams, another good friend of mine, he used to dine with him every year. Um, then the most extraordinary man of all. I'll mention his name so you'll, you'll never forget. Keith Barron, the Indiana Jones of the world today. Dr. Keith Barron. He's an extraordinary man. He, he's on the board of many universities and the Getty Museum. He's also the man who has the finest and best collection of Roman gold coins in the world. He was in Nobles the other late 2019 for having dinner and after but before he saw the copy of the London magazine of coins. On the front cover was the gold uh, aureus of Electus, a Roman ruler. Only one of the only one of that type known, only two or three known. And it mentioned the fact that it sold for over half a million pounds. Now I see my coins on the front cover. <laughs> <laughs> I think he bought the Ides of March gold coin too. Uh, he, he, I can tell you so much about him. He's an extraordinary man. Why is he in down there Jones? He's a geologist. Uh, he, he owns the largest uh, sapphire mine in the world in Minnesota. Uh, Montana, I should say, correction, Montana. And we were generally showing sapphires after they've been polished. And this is a $20,000 sapphire, this is a $40,000 sapphire. Uh, I, he, collected, he said, I get hundred weights of these and send them to my people that polish these and shine them up in Solon or Sri Lanka or Thailand. Um, I'm stunned by this. You know. He sold one of his gold mines. He's got gold mines in every country in the world. He sold one for over half a billion dollars in about 10 years ago. That I do know. I would like to have him adopt me. <laughs> so I can keep collecting. But no, he's an extraordinary man. And that's probably brings me to the end. One other person I should mention, I've got a book here. The greatest Islamist in the world is Steve Alvin. Now this book here details on two pages of copper coal and raw coal, three on one side, four on the other, something like about three or four hundred dynasties. I mean, you appreciate the dynasties of the Islamic world. In their dynasties are rulers, and sometimes, like the Abbasids, there might be 30 or 40 rulers. 
not only is there, there are 30, 40 builders, they're probably coming from up to 100 different mints. He wrote this book off the top of his head. It's a standard work. I don't know if any of you have seen this book, Steve Alvin's book. He's doing an updated version. He's about my age now. But I know he writes this book off the top of his head because when he was staying with me at my holiday home, or well, what was my holiday home before I got burnt down a year and a half ago, uh, down at the Conjola Park, he spent a week with us there. In three days, he wrote four more pages of this book off the top of his head. So what I'm trying to say to you, there are people in the world, he was a great collector, by the way. He was a collector dealer, but his collection was sold at Tobingen University, what he had. Uh, He's the most extraordinary man in the world. He wrote these Oxford, Oxford University syllages on Islamic coins, on areas of Islamic coins, volumes over that thick each, in three months, and have it printed. Most people spend a lifetime writing one of these books. And if you ever read one, you realise the detail is unbelievable. So that's probably a good note to finish up on. Thank you. Well, when you uh, said by way of introduction that one of the things that defined a collector was enthusiasm, and, uh, <laughs> you've beautifully illustrated that. We have time just for one question, and we'll ask George if you. Uh, when I joined the society over 50 years ago, in Sydney there was three shining lights as far as I was concerned, and that was Mark Freehill, Jim Noble, and Colin Pitfall. And one of you, and I, I think it was uh, Freehill, but I wouldn't bet on it. So if anybody asked him, what did you collect? And, they, and he would say, I collect the world by date. <laughs> and just quickly on Ray Jewell, I knew Ray Jewell by mail fairly well when he started to work for Max Stern. And I still have in my collection quite a lot of coins, the cheaper ones you might say because he'd send me a parcel of these regularly about every month from the, uh, the John Hag Hagley collection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so Thank you very much, George. I think we'll we'll have to finish on that page, okay. Colin. Uh, if you want to see me after, I've got to talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Colin's staying this afternoon. Yeah. So we have all afternoon to speak to him, too. Yeah. I think, Colin, we've caught your enthusiasm. Could we just stand up for a minute and wriggle our toes oh, for a second? <laughs> It's <laughs> 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 Colleagues, can we reconvene? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure now to introduce uh, Ian Seisland. Uh, Ian is uh, well known to us as, uh, for the last uh, five years as a, a colleague in our society. Uh, Ian's a, an electronics uh, technician. Uh, he works for Allied Data Systems. He lives in uh, Cromer in Sydney and based in, in Sydney. Um, just in talking with Ian, uh, he like many here is a, an animal lover. Uh, which is a lovely, lovely thing. He's a, a passionate scuba diver as, as well. Uh, Ian does uh, secret work for the Department of Defence, uh, especially for the Royal Australian Navy. He's an expert on Doppler systems, which is, uh, uh, as we all know, perhaps we're all touched by that by speed, by speed cameras and, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. But that's uh, Ian's uh, specialty work. So he contributes, as, uh, of course, to keep us all safe. So thank you Ian and we're looking forward very much to the, the counter marks of Mel Weeks. Thank you very much. A hard act to uh, follow after Colin, thank you. <laughs> um, firstly, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, just a definition of what a counter mark coin is. This is Wikipedia mind you. The, the counter mark uh, is a, a, a punch or stab coin um, that has had some additional mark or symbol punched into it. 
at some point after it was originally produced while in circulation. Um, they put at the end of that is the practice is now obsolete, which I don't think is true, <laughs> as we're about to show you. Uh, so, firstly, Mel Wicks, he's, um, he's new to me too. Uh, I came across this by accident. Um, I, I uh, use um, eBay quite a lot to find things, and uh, I came across this um, counter mark coin, and I thought, well, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I could just speak up here. So. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, an eBay coin uh, that I, I got interested in and I, I came, uh, purchased it, and then I started doing the research. I, that's often how I, I do things. So I, I find it, I, I, I like it, and I basically do the research. So Mel is. Um, uh, Founding member of the Israeli Numismatic Numismatic Society, that's a, a A I N A. Um, he's been the president uh, from 2020, as you can see. Uh, he's also the director of the Jewish um, American Hall of Fame, uh, which produce large Art Deco type um, medals, and there's been a range running since 1960. Nine. Uh, he's also <coughs> the, the founder of the Biblical Numismatic Society since 77. Uh, he then started producing counter stamp coins from 76 through to 84, uh, and it's just a way to commem commemorate the special events in America and around the world. Uh, I have two of those coins, which I've got and I'm going to talk about now. Um, but uh, over, the, over those years, he's produced over 10,000 countermark coins. Uh, I've got a listing here of the actual 21 that he actually produced between 84 and, sorry, 76 and 84. Um, I'll go through those and show, show the actual pictures of those later. But the coins that I actually have uh, is this one, which is the one I first purchased, which is a... Um, International Year of the Child. Uh, it's been stamped over a Eisenhower dollar in 1977, and as you can see, his inspiration was for um, obviously UNESCO announcing in 1979 the uh, International Year of the Child, and uh, it was then signed on that. 1st of January 1979. The design actually came from uh, Leonardo da Vinci's um, uh, child in, in utero, in utero uh, and he's basically just used that as the uh, inspiration for the coin. A very nice coin, uh, and it came over very nice. Uh, the next one that I've had in my collection is the wedding of Char Prince Charles and Lady Diana in 1981. Um, his inspiration there was the, where the actual wedding took place and he's put the uh, cathedral of um, uh, oh, Paul. Paul. take the time. Um, yeah, so, sorry, it's the chapel where they were married. <coughs> this is the actual original coin in the catalogue, and it's actually been printed on a different Canadian dollar. Uh, it's, I'll just go back. So my, my coin is actually uh, stamped on a uh, 1966 coin and it, it's a bit hard to tell but um, it's got the, uh, the canoe and the paddler, that's the canoe yeah. there. Voyager dollar. Hmm? 
The Voyager Dollars. The Voyager yeah. Dollar, that's the one. Yeah. But the, the actual uh, the one in the catalogue is the 1964 version of it, so there are some varieties out there. Um, so that, they're the two coins that I have, and I'll just go to the <coughs> next one. No, you have to go right down to your name. Oh, do I? Do okay. you? Yeah, just go down to it. Yeah. Um, let me, I'll do that for you. This um, Yeah, it's just, um, let me just get out of there and um, I'll, I'll do that for you. I'll get, get you on to the next stage. That's it there, I've got it. Huh? Got got it. the right one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for uh, no, uh, Slideshow at the top. Up a bit. Up to the top. There, there. Yep. That's it. Like this. And then across to the left and from the beginning. Thank you. Right, so what I'm going to do now is I'll just go through the actual um, uh, collection that have been produced. The first one being uh, in 1976, the Mars landing. Of Viking. So his inspiration here was uh, he's used the um, <coughs> the, the sorry, excuse me. He wanted to create this coin on a um, That's an Eisenhower dollar. Yes, it is. It's on another Eisenhower dollar. Yeah, both of them. He also produced um, the PNC version of it, and this is the first image from NASA of the surface of the Mars. And he then used that as the inspiration for the, the background of the coin. And you also notice that he's used Mars, uh, <coughs> Pennsylvania. And cancelled the can't got the cancellation done by the postmaster there, uh, and put some stamps on it for, that represented the, the actual mission. So the next one that he has produced was uh, Thanksgiving, and he's used the turkey um, <laughs> over the bell, <laughs> and he also produced a uh, PNC for that, and he's gone to. Turkey in Texas. Uh, <laughs> so having a bit of fun with it. Uh, these are these are really hard to find. Uh, I checked on eBay and they're they're worth you know sort of selling for about fifteen uh, fifteen hundred dollars uh, for the PNC if you can find them. Uh, moving on, his third coin that he produced was for the Peace Summit, and he's just used the uh, the emblem of. Um, uh, so this is between Israel and um, uh, Egypt. Palestinians. Yeah. Egypt. <laughs> Egypt. Yeah. Egypt. Yeah. So the Camp David Peace Summit. So he's, he's used some really interesting toppings as he's, as he's done it. This is the coin that I have. The year of the child. And then John Paul, uh, sorry, Pope John Paul's visit to Mexico. Um, he's showing here the, the actual coin, and then this is how he, he defines the, 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 can, the cancellation of the actual um, die, uh, just if it gets ever used again. So he's put the, showing that that's how he cancels them. Each of these coins, he only produces between 500 and 1,000 of. So they're very limited in uh, you know, being able to obtain them. During the process of this, he used some clad coins, and uh, when you stamp the clad coin, which are the two different layers, <coughs> they tend to split. So there's quite a few of these out there, and they're actually even more popular as a collect collectible item because there's a lot less of them. Yes. You, you probably find out some of these things that you see as you produce your coins. And then this is Mexico. So the Pope uh, travelled around the world 
uh, going to various countries. Uh, it was the first time ever uh, the Pope had visited uh, the US, uh, so that was a very big event for him. Um, <clears throat> he's then produced a bicentennial talia celebrating uh, uh, Marie Theresa. Uh, 1770 to 1970, stamped on a. Um, yeah, sorry. He's then produced um, one for the Moscow Games in 1980, and this is his inspiration, which is uh, the uh, pottery of um, uh, Greece. Images. Lake Placid Winter Olympics. Hockey team. Another one was the inaugura inauguration of the 40th president, Ronald Reagan. Uh, this is the in an Eisenhower dollar. Same year is the release of the 52 American hostages. <coughs> Princess Diana. Royal Reagan. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Equal Justice Under Law. So this is her. Uh, uh, <coughs> coming to the Supreme Court. And then John, Pope John Paul visiting England in 82. This is on a uh, English penny. 1967. George Washington, um, 70, 1732 to 1982, 250 years. 50 years. <clears throat> Summer Olympics. Weightlifting. And the flame. Harry, uh, Harry S. Truman, Centennial, 84 to 1884 to 1984. This is the house that he lived in. Again, 30 years later, so this is, he had a break from uh, 84. Um, interesting that he, he also produced, during that period between 84 and 20, uh, 20, 2010, I think it was, uh, he was actually producing coins for Hutt River in uh, WA for the province of the, uh, the then uh, Prince um, Leonardo, Leonardo uh, self-proclaimed um, micro, micro nation of Australia, so who's producing um, commemorative coins for him in that period. So from 2015 to 2016, he produced three more coins, and that's the last of the, his actual collection. So this is for um, Albert Einstein. And then my favourite, which is uh, which is the one I did a talk on in the online version of the ANS last year, was the Hog Money, uh, the, which is um, Bermuda and he celebrated the 400th anniversary of the hog money. So there's, that's the original, I think it's a sixpence there, uh, and he's just celebrated it um, on a, again, a half, uh, a Kennedy half dollar. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you again. Hello. Oh, sorry. So we're allowed to ask you any questions except about <laughs> secret stuff? And droppers. <laughs> I mean, what, what happens to the other side of the coin? Is it damaged? When well, I could show you on um, 
Is that the one? Well, actually, I've got here. The problem is, is right there. Put that up in the, the little screen, if you like. Flip that over, you'll see the Eisenhower. Can you take this into video? <laughs> so that's the struck side. It's not too bad. This is the. Um, that's the. Like a rubber. You see, it flattens it out slightly, but it doesn't ruin the point. <coughs> when Bruce used to countermark the shillings and what next. <coughs> He used to have a sort of backing so that yeah. it, it didn't didn't damage it as much. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's a it's, soft metal like aluminium yeah. or something. Yeah, it's, well, he's but it uh, it does flatten things out. Coins, so I tend to uh, uh, not split too much as the uh, the uh, laminated ones. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so you get into trouble uh, if you damage coin of the realm in Australia and England. Mm -hmm. I can understand you don't get into trouble if you damage some other realm's coins. But does this not occur in America? You can Apparently do whatever not. you want to coins in America. Uh, yes. Apart from sticking an advertising sticker on it and putting it back in circulation, you can damage, bend, bend, mutilate, do whatever you want in the name of art, and, and it's fine, it's legal. <laughs> Thank you. That answers the question. You can do that to American oh. coins or anyone else's coins. <laughs> Ian, I, I gather he, because of his early involvement, his involvement with the uh, American Jewish uh, papers on it, he must have been Jewish himself. Yes. I wonder why he never picked some of the great highlights of it, 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 Jewish history, like, and, and to try something like a menorah coin on there. Uh, so, for the, for the, for the, um, Countermarking, he was using it only to produce uh, an income for the American historic, uh, sorry, the American Jewish Hall of Fame, which then produced medals for uh, celebrating Jewish uh, uh, accomplishments around the world. So he, they they concentrate on making the medals and <coughs> to um, you know, Barbara Streisand. And well, uh, yeah, I, I suppose the reality. Uh, Israel, we've well, got a massive collection of Israel's uh, medals that have been produced over the last 50, 60 years. And uh, they've featured some of these historical uh, attributes that they claim to have mm -hmm. on their medals. And, uh, and I thought that him being involved with a problem of the same goal was that he's making for American race and American culture. He has a very large collection of uh, the, the Jewish going back to biblical times. So that's his. Uh, have, have you met the man? No, I haven't. This is all just research online. Have you met him, Colin? No. Oh, I don't believe I can't. Possibly, like, better than that. Is he going to be done? Thank you. You're looking at the various countermarks. I couldn't first stick out <coughs> any themes of it all. It seemed to be very random to me, anyway. They were. They were just events that were occurring on the year. And uh, they produce, generally produce one or one per year during the uh, from seventy six through to eighty four. And the one I like the best mm -hmm. is the one with the big bracket. Yeah, could you yeah, say, I did too. George, <laughs> speak up, please. Oh, so, so, yeah, well, the, the one I liked the best was the one that had the big crack in it. <coughs> That's the story cool. comes out that with Bruce Canning with the crack so you know the the point he produced for the society one time. You know, that's another day. John. Uh, how long did he sell the coins to the public or to collectors? Through, through magazines. Um, as I said, he produced between five and uh, a thousand of each of those coins. Uh, but he would just announce it in, in a magazine and they would just get snapped up. 
So if we could just ask you, John, uh, John, so the, they, they're strictly speaking, uh, are they tokens or what are, what, what, how would we describe, what's the official name? Countermark, countermark. Yeah. Yes. Countermark, countermark coins. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Pri privately countermark coins to distinguish them from a government countermark. Right. Yeah. Right. So he's used legal, legal circulating coins. Yeah, legal tender. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. With the, you, you showed us the, the Lady Diana one where there were two different Canadian dollars. Mm -hmm. Does he only countermark on one? No. One one. He'll Don't. use Canadian dollars, but a, a range from, so that in uh, 65 and 66, there was the, the canoe or the Voyager, Voyager. Voyager one, um, and then one, in 64, there was only one of the 64 uh, Canadian dollar, the silver Canadian dollar. Right, so, so the, the, whole, the whole thousand or 500 that he produces is, would be on, this, on the same... Yeah. Same coin. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and where were these stamped? Yeah. In in the US. So obviously they've, private, got, private. they've got their own uh, um, press. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's the same guy that did the Hutt River coins, I think they were done in California somewhere. Um, but but uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, We'd, all the all of us together would love you to have this uh, medal. Just before presenting it formally to Ian, could I just mention this will be a question in the quiz, remember? Uh, Rod's beautiful medal uh, that he's given to all the speakers uh, on my behalf. Uh, there is a, a, an error in the original artist in the rigging of the ship. So that's going to be a question in the quiz. <laughs> I go for a worry about that. So we can have a really precious error in the room. Oh, yeah. Thank you. On behalf of us. Could you say that question is rigged, is it? Plutarch, <laughs> he tells of a time when the young Julius Caesar, who was about 25 at the time, was taken prisoner by Cilician pirates in the Mediterranean Sea and they demanded 20 talents of, of precious metal as a ransom for his release. His response was unusual. He laughed at them and said, hey, don't you know how important I am? I'm worth at least 50 talents. And they said, all right, well, we'll ask for 50 talents. And that's what they got. But they also got something else that they didn't um, bargain for, and that was that after the ransom got paid, he had them chased down and crucified, <laughs> all of them. Uh, so, so that's just to, uh, one of the ancient examples. 50 tal talents has been <coughs> estimated by one modern numismatist as about 60 million wow. uh, US dollars. So that's, uh, kidnapping has a long history. <laughs> In modern times, as we know, it's more regarded as a crime or a terrorist act, and most most people who are targeted refuse to deal with the kidnappers. Um, but some wealthy families have been known still to pay huge ransoms, <coughs> and um, you get military force often involved in, like you know, and lots of movies about this sort of thing. Like, remember the Israeli. Uh, rescue of the hostages at Entebbe many, many years ago now. So yes, the, it still happens, but it's, uh, it's still a crime. And of course, all of those Cold War movies um, about uh, political exchange of political prisoners and that kind of thing. But in medieval times, it was legal as long as it was in battle. If a king was captured in battle, then it was regarded as quite a legitimate strategy. Now, <coughs> the reasons for that. Waging war demanded a huge uh, treasure chest, and the king could only get that only <coughs> by taxing his subjects. And that's why um, it was much easier 
to capture somebody who was <coughs> really important and demand a ransom to fill your coffers because it had the added advantage of depleting the coffers of your opponent. Uh, much the same as after World War I, the huge reparations imposed on Germany uh, had the same effect. It crippled the economy of your opponent so he couldn't come back at you in a hurry, basically. But the interesting thing about it was that once uh, a treaty was signed and agreed to, then it was considered both legally and morally binding. Now, today I'm going to focus on four famous medieval kings, and you might have heard of at least one of them. The first one's Richard the Lionheart, or Richard I of England. And then we've got King, uh, King Louis the Ninth of France, and he was known as Saint Louis. Then we'll look at David Bruce uh, of Scotland, uh, David the Second, and then finally Jean Jean Le Bon, John the Good, he's known as of France. So I'd say uh, grab onto your saddles. We're going now on a two-century gap, a uh, gallop two-century gallop um, through medieval history. We're going to also look at the ransoms themselves, the amounts and millions of dollars, the coinage that was most likely used for the payment, and you'll see some of, you've seen some of them in the display there, and also the effect on the economies of those countries. The first king, then, is Richard Plantagenet of England. That's his escutcheon there. And he lived, as you see, in the second half of the 12th century. <coughs> now, Richard, as I think David mentioned yesterday, was the son of King Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine. She was a wealthy, powerful ruler in her own right. And so Richard inherited large territories in France from both his father through the line that descended from William the Conqueror and through his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. You can see that they had a lot of kids. And the ones I'd like you to think about today, or I'd like you to take note of, of course, Richard, that he is the third son, you notice, his younger sister Joan, or known as Joanna in the Latin countries. His little brother John, who tends out to be a bit of a baddie in the piece. Um, and his older sister Matilda, indirectly. She was married to... Uh, no, so I can't tell you. She, I'll, I'll, she was married to uh, a man called Duke Henry the Lion, and he was a vassal of the Holy Roman Emperor. Just to spoil that information away for later. Okay. Joan married William II of Sicily, so she was Queen of Sicily, and that figures hugely in the story of Richard's ransom. John, of course, uh, we know, well, he'll come back into the story. You can see a map of the territories there of um, France, which was quite small. That's the green bit. Does anybody have trouble with red-green uh, hues? No, good. So, so France was quite small. Well, royal France was quite small. Feudal France included all the purple and pink and orange and red areas. But all of the Plantagenet dominions really covered all this western part of France. There's the Duchy of Aquitaine, there's Gascony, there's Poitou, Normandy up there, Brittany, and then all these others, Nantes, Anjou, Maine, Nantes. Um, and so Richard, as he was, when he became King of England, really didn't spend much time there. Some people think only about six months of his life after he was. Um, you know, um, he had his childhood there, but 
but uh, a lot of time looking after his uh, French feudal territories. He owed fealty to the French king through, through that. Now, apparently he, he was quite a charismatic character. And, and as you know, he's probably a, became, become a bit of a folk hero over the centuries since, since his time. <coughs> Oh, you can see the, the, the description there given by one of the chroniclers of his physical appearance. He's, he, he was a every inch a warrior, basically. Very good looking, very uh, very charismatic military leader and, uh, and thinker. And also character flaws, including a very fiery temper, which we'll see evidence of shortly, and that contributed also. To his ransom. Now, all of the other three kings we're going to talk about were captured in battle. That was straightforward. No legal problems, no moral problems, no religious problems. But Richard's story was different, and so that's why I have to tell you a little bit more about him. Now, I know history isn't everybody's thing. So if you feel that um, uh, when, when we come to some of these boring historical bits that you need to maybe inspect the inside of your eyelids for a little while, that's fine. Um, I'll let you know when we're coming to the ransom bits. <laughs> okay? <coughs> but, um, no, he wasn't captured in battle. So would you like to know a little bit about why he was captured or how? Sure. Um, okay, but if you if I see you glazing over, I'll try and skip over it a bit. <laughs> okay. So he led the Third Crusade to the Holy Land jointly with Philip II of France, known as Philip Augustus, and they travelled from northern France down to the Mediterranean coast. I'll show you a map in a moment. Uh, and they each embarked on their own large fleets to sail to to the Holy Land. Uh, and, and their fleets took different routes. But they but Richard went via Sicily, because that's where his little sister was, and via Cyprus. And we'll see there were the, he encountered two particularly nasty characters on the way that he really felt he had to deal with. So that really delayed his arrival in the Holy Land, um, but they, they were really pretty pretty bad. Now, I think I've shown you the wrong one, version. I had a better version, which was much easier to see, but I haven't got it there. It's, it's not the right one. So I'll, uh, I'll summarize it. In Sicily, Joan had just been widow, widowed, and she, didn't, she and her husband didn't have any heirs, and so a cousin of her late husband, uh, he was one of the nasty pieces of work, he had seized the throne, disinherited Joan, taken all her inheritance, and imprisoned her. Richard was not pleased. His reaction? He attacked Messina, pillaged it, forced Tancred, in, Tancred into releasing his sister, and compensating her, basically. So um, that was one of the uh, enemies that he made along the way, shall we say. Then his uh, fiancée arrived, and so she and his sister hopped on one of the other ships, and the whole fleet set sail for Arc in 1191. Um, the map I'll show you is there. Acre is there. The Crusader Kingdom by this time had been diminished hugely. Jerusalem had been taken by Saladin and there were just these Crusader settlements really. It was part of the Kingdom of Jerusalem here but Acre was the main centre that was still in the hands of the Crusaders, and so uh, that's where they set sail for. We have to go back a bit though, because on the way, 
There are whole, always very heavy storms at this end of the Mediterranean, apparently. Um, Richard's fleet was scattered by a storm, and um, a lot of his ships were wrecked around Cyprus. And the other baddie in the story here is Isaac Komnenos. He was part of the Byzant he was related to the Byzantine emperors in Constantinople, uh, but he was a bit of a renegade. He imprisoned all the uh, all the sailors who had survived the wreck, their shipwreck. He refused fresh water to uh, the ship that had uh, Richard's fiance and uh, own sister on, and uh, if they had not. A if they had agreed to become his prisoners, he would have given them water, but he would have also demanded huge ransoms for them. But they wouldn't agree, so uh, that's what happened. There's Richard's response, see here. He, uh, <coughs> he deposed the ruler, conquered the whole country, whole island of Cyprus, didn't really want it or need it, but he wanted to make sure that nobody mistreated his sister and his fiance, uh, and took his treasure ships as well. Um, so there we go. Komnenos uh, was another enemy now, and couldn't uh, come back to Cyprus later on when, if he might have needed to. Stayed there and married Berengaria and had her crown, and then they got oh, finally to our crown. Now, we're not going to talk about what happened during the crusade. As David mentioned yesterday, the first crusade was the main successful one. All the others reached a, uh, uh, either ended in disaster or reached a stalemate. This one was a stalemate. But uh, Leopold, Duke of Austria, was the third ruler who uh, saw himself as a leader of the crusade. Richard and the French King Philip both felt that he hadn't contributed as much as they had to the, to the capture of Acre, recapture of Acre, and, and so uh, they felt that his standard should not be allowed to fly above Acre, uh, in, uh, beside theirs. So Richard's men uh, took, you know, took his cue from, from their leader and they tore it down, chucked it in the moat which led to another enemy being made by Richard there. Leopold, in high dudgeon, left the crusade, went back. Okay, now Richard hung around waging battles with Saladin, Salah al-Din, al um, we've heard of him probably. He was the, the Muslim leader and Finally, Richard reached an agreement with him because he had to go home. He, he'd, uh, you know, his troops had been uh, attacked by various um, ailments, shall we say. Uh, his brother, John, he heard, was plotting against him back in England. And if you've watched a Robin Hood movie or read a, one of Walter Scott's books involving the stories of Robin Hood, you'll know why uh, John was regarded as a bit of a baddie himself. Philip also had left the crusade by this time and gone back to France and, and, and he was a worry around the edges of Richard's uh, French territories as well and so Richard just felt he had to reach an agreement with Saladin and off they went. But on the way home, which way could he go now? Couldn't go by Cyprus and, and Sicily as, as, as you normally would have been straight back to, 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 the, to the south of France. Um, the only way, he, he, he decided to hop on a ship and go up the Adriatic and see if he could get across that way. His ship was wrecked as well and so up near Aquileia, which is the, I don't know why it's a number 14, but that's where Aquileia was. He, had to tra he wanted to travel overland to the territory where his sister lived, his older sister, Matilda, remember, we saw her on the, on the uh, uh, family tree. But uh, uh, she was married to Henry the Lion. And Henry the Lion was not in good favour with the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry VI. 
Leopold, remember Leopold from Arca? Well, Leopold's territories, he was Duke of Austria, somewhere in there. Richard had to go through his territories. It was dangerous. So he disguised himself as a Knight Templar and only went accompanied by a couple of people. And they, they went off to, um, uh, to travel through there. But when he got near Vienna, he got recognized and Leopold seized the chance and imprisoned Richard. Now, it was illegal to imprison a fellow crusader, especially a returning crusader. And so the Pope immediately dis uh, excommunicated Leopold, but that didn't help Richard because he was still in prison. Uh, Leopold turned him over to his overlord, the Holy Roman Emperor, and he had issues with him as well. So he demanded a, a ransom. Okay, you can wake up now. Here's the ransom bit. <coughs> 150,000 marks. Well, what's a mark? It wasn't a coin. It was a weight of, of precious metal. And you can see up there the values of it. Um, 150,000 marks was more than two or three times the annual income of the English crown. And so his mother, who was a strong supporter of Richard, raised very heavy taxes, including the clergy. They, they were upset because they were normally exempt. But she managed to raise enough to pay the ransom in full. In the meantime, little brother John thought, here's my chance to have a go at older brother Richard, because he was not, uh, they, they weren't good friends, you might say. What happened next was that John offered the Holy Roman Emperor 80,000 marks to keep him in prison. <coughs> But uh, the, uh, the Henry decided that wasn't quite the done thing. Um, so he, especially as the whole ransom was being offered to him, so he accepted the whole ransom, declined John's offer, and Richard was finally released. And uh, went back to England to see what John, what havoc John had been causing in England. Now, the ransom itself, Well, at that time, late 12th century, there were no gold coins minted in England. Gold was scarce. Richard had silver coins. And uh, the value of the ransom, now I have to acknowledge David's help here. He did a lot of calculations for me. Um, he weighed the, the coins that, that were the nearest to, to the, um, the weight needed. And he did his calculations, and there's Richard's ransom there. Um, it wasn't, no, this is an old version, David. What's, um, how many billion dollars was it? Keep, keep going, I think you've got another slide on that, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I don't know how, we, how we've got the old version here. I'm, uh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I had, I had it, uh, oh, it's over here. I'll, excuse me a moment, I'll tell you. <coughs> It was $181 million Australian. Wow. So that numismatist who said $17 million was way off, really. This is just on the gold value. Okay, now that's the end of Richard. His is the longest story of the three kings. So why don't you take a break now for a moment, have a wriggle and a stretch if you'd like, and then we'll go on to the next, the next king. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the uh, oh. Before you do, I'll show you the other coins of Richard. You can see his uh, a stylized face there. There's the eyes. There's the beard. There's the crown. There's the short cross where they cut it to make farthings and halfpennies. Um, it doesn't have Richard's name on it. It has his father's name, Henry Henricus in Latin. But we know it was Richard's because Henry didn't mint any coins in Canterbury. Okay, now you can take your break for a moment.
Are you ready to go on? Okay. Fresh a little bit? So Richard would have had to pay an awful lot of Discuss silver it later. pennies for his ransom. He would have used some of his French ones as well. There's one uh, from uh, Poitou. It says Ricardus Rex around there and uh, Pictaliensis there in Poitou in Latin. Uh, and then also one from Aquitaine, the silver denier. Denier, of course, a penny in English. And uh, that's the only, um, that's really what he would have had to offer. Now the next king, are you ready for another king? Yep. Okay. He was known as Saint Louis. He was Louis the Ninth of France. And you can see he's about half a century further on from Richard. And he was the son of Louis the Eighth of France. There's a picture, lovely picture of him there in a, a manuscript, medieval manuscript called the Toledo Bible. It's just loaded with, with guilt. And um, we bought a copy um, of it when we were in Spain, uh, a copy of one sheet, and it's this, this page <coughs> that we've got hanging on our wall in our hall. It's just, it just glints in the light. Um, anyway, going back to, to uh, Louis, he was a young king. He became uh, king at 12, so his mother was regent, Blanche of Castile. David mentioned her yesterday, I think. And Louis was king of France for quite a long time. Why was he called Saint Louis? Well, he was regarded during his lifetime as a saintly man. He had a great sense of honour. He um, looked after his, his feudal lords the right way. Nobody had any cause for complaint against Louis uh, unless they infringed his, his code of conduct. He expected everybody to reach the same standard he did. And he could be pretty tough on those people who, who he thought weren't re really quite reaching the mark. But uh, he was regarded as a saintly man and um, according to the rights of, and, and processes of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, after his death, he met the criteria to be canonized by the Pope. So that's why he's called Saint Louis, and also because, of course, he was a crusader. He led the Seventh Crusade, so there were a lot of crusades between Richard on the Third and uh, Louis on the 7th, but it was only half a century. He became very ill and he made a vow. If I survive, I will go on crusade. He did survive, he recovered, and he, it took him three years to raise enough money, basically, taxing his people and the clergy again. Um, his mother was regent, and he also had to make sure that uh, his realm would be uh, safe while he was away. And there is a painting of him, and I have no idea what the source is, except that I got it off Wikipedia. So um, I apologise for that. It's uh, probably copyright, so don't uh, put it, don't publish it in anything. Um, but there's Louis leaving the port of Aigues-Mort in the south of France. It still has these walls on, on all four sides of the, of the town. David and I went there, what, about 20 years ago? And uh, these days, instead of uh, uh, embarking crusaders, it's got these little tourist trains. You can go right around the walls. <laughs> but if you're ever in that part of France, it is a fantastic 
uh, in fantastically preserved um, city. The city walls are just phenomenal. But there's Louis embarking on his ship to go across to Africa. <coughs> but he wasn't going via he wasn't going straight to up. He stopped in Cyprus because he needed to consult with the leaders of the remaining Crusader kingdoms, and there weren't many now. And the, the seat of power now wasn't in the Holy Land, it was down here. The, um, it was the Ayyubid dynasty in, in Egypt. So he decided after consulting he'd go there. Um, so they uh, embarked to Accra. Another storm in the Mediterranean. Half, uh, about a third of his fleet arrived in Damietta in Egypt. Uh, sorry, where is it? There. Damietta is there on the Mediterranean coast at the mouth of the Nile, one of the tributaries of the Nile. When he arrived, the, no, the expectation was that he would wait and see how many of his, uh, the remnant of his other fleet would turn up so that he would have sufficient troops to, uh, to progress with his crusade. But um, Louis decided to strike while the iron was hot and launched an attack which took the Egyptians by surprise and they easily took Damietta. And so his, uh, his advisors and his, his, his uh, count, you know, other counts said, all right, well, let's go to Alexandria straight away while the iron's hot and, and um, uh, press our advantage. But Louis didn't want to do that. He wanted to go to Cairo because that's where, that's where the, uh, the rulers were. He wanted to get the seat of power. But he had many reasons to regret that decision. Oh yes, well I've told you all about that one, but uh, but I love that illustration, don't you, of the of Louis and his boat? I hope it wasn't really that quite like that. It looks like more like a refugee boat, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, so we, we've talked about all that, and we've talked about that. Now these are the reasons why he regretted, or he, he should have regretted if if he didn't. It was so difficult crossing the Nile Delta. While he was under attack every now and then from the from the uh, Muslims, and uh, his uh, brothers hadn't turned up yet. Or, oh yes, he waited till he sorry he waited till they turned up. Uh, anyway, he never made it to Cairo. There was a huge pitch battle at Al Mansura, and there's a picture from a medieval manuscript showing Louis and the crusaders with their fleur de lis, the horses in their sort of comparisons. Uh, he lost most of his army and one of his brothers in the battle, uh, and the rest were taken prisoner. A lot of the ordinary soldiers weren't as lucky as Louis and some, some of his nobles because they were executed when they refused to uh, uh, become Muslim. So finally they were able to negotiate a ransom. Now here it is. You can wake up again now. Ransom time. Uh, 400,000 livres. Some accounts call them livres tournois and some say bezels. So I've given you a key. Down here, what's a livre tournois? Well it wasn't a coin, there wasn't one. The pound was a bit like the the, the talent or the uh, or, or the uh, mark. It was a unit of weight. There was a gros tournois issued by Louis, but it wasn't until he, he was released and went back home, so it couldn't have been that one. Well, he, but uh, here we are, and and there was no. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. So there was a gold livre tournois, but minted a, a sort of a century later, or half a century, half a century later. Okay, so what's a peasant? Well, that was the term used by the English speaker, speaking crusaders. Um, originally, the term came from 
uh, from Byzantium. It was a the, it was a Byzantine gold solidus, but by by the time of Louis, it was really a reference to the dinar, the Muslim dinar, and that would have been what was used for the payment. The Crusader Kingdom minted. Oh, there, there's one. There's a lovely dinner. That's a Fatimid one from the previous dynasty, but that would have still been in circulation. Um, I haven't got images of them here, but over in the, the display case, you can also see one of Saladin and one of uh, the Egyptian leader Baibars, who also uh, issued a dinar. Any dinars that were genuine Muslim Arabic dinars would have been acceptable to pay this ransom, I'm sure. What wouldn't have been so acceptable were the Crusader imitations. And this is what they <coughs> this is what the bezants were. The first bezant here, uh, that was uh, had a Quranic ins inscription. It was issued by the Crusaders. They wanted it to be acceptable to the to the uh, the local communities around around in the Holy Land, the Muslims. Uh, but the Pope intervened. He said, no, you can't do that. You've got to have a Christian symbol. <coughs> so they issued another one. They put a cross on it, and they had a, uh, a Christian inscription in Arabic. And they also issued a, a dirham, which is a, you know, a smaller denomination. But I don't think that the Egyptians would have wanted any of those. They wanted the genuine bezants, or the genuine dinars rather than the bezants. There's Louis' first Grand Tournoi, the first one ever, ever issued. He issued that when he was finally released. Very nice coin. And uh, it became the prototype for lots and lots of Grand Tournoi. Um, that's the end of the next king, so have a, have a quick stretch if you like. <laughs> Did they pay the ransom? <laughs> yes, they did. He had to pay, I'll go back and show you that. He had to pay half before they let him go. And then he went up to Arca and he leaned on the Knights Templar there because he didn't have quite enough in his treasure chest uh, and he sort of requisitioned a bit from them and the whole ransom was paid. Yes, paid in full. But, David, how much did we say now? How many? I'll tell you again. I'll have to look it up here because I've got the wrong version there. $140 million Australian. Let me know when you'd like to go on. Okay. Next king, David II of Scotland. Now we're in the 14th century. So we've galloped through quite a bit of history so far. David was a young king, shall we say. King Robert II, Robert I of Scotland was his father. Robert the Bruce, his, he was a f Scottish hero. And um, they married young, didn't, didn't they, in those days? <laughs> uh, he was four, his wife was seven. She was the uh, daughter of King Edward II of England. Now, Edward really had his sights on the Scottish, on control of Scotland at this point. And uh, that led, that's what led to David's capture and ransom. Uh, there were a whole lot of regents. The first one didn't last really, he died after six months or something like that. Um, and King Edward II of England was anxious to have somebody um, that he, who, who's, uh, who, who would answer to him as, as regent while, while David was still a child. So there were wars and skirmishes, battles between the English and the Scottish over this time. So they sent uh, Joan and 
and, uh, and David to Scotland, to, to France. And you can see them there with uh, Philip VI of France, there's David, and there's, there's Jones there somewhere, you can see there. Um, so he stayed there till he was 17. By that time, things had got to be quiet with England. They felt it was safe to send David back. But you need to know about this bit of history, so don't, don't uh, expect your eyelids yet. The Old Alliance. The Old Alliance was uh, a, an agreement between uh, France and Scotland that if England attacked either one of them, the other one would invade England. Now, the English were in Normandy now at this point. That was the time of about the, the famous Battle of Crecy that you might have heard of. Um, and, and so uh, David felt obliged to invade England, even though he wasn't really keen on the idea. But uh, there was a decisive battle and uh, he was captured in October 1346. And he ended up in the Tower of London. Now, some of the time he was accommodated in a, in a more comfortable castle, but 11 years it took to negotiate the, the treaty and the agreement on the ransom. 11 years he was captive in England, but he was accorded more privileges and uh, comfort than your average prisoner in the Tower of London. They finally agreed on the ransom, 100,000 <coughs> Merks. Well, a Merk was a Scottish mark. And there again, it was a lot of money. In fact, I can tell you how much it is in Australian dollars now. It was $121 million Australian. And so then he was sent back, he was allowed to go back to Scotland to raise money. How did he pay? Well, with this beautiful coin, which I, it keeps flashing past, there it is. He minted a gold noble, the only gold coin of David II. Uh, and it's thought that it was minted especially to pay the ransom. There's only four known, four known now. And that's probably because they, the English melted them all down, I would suspect. Um, so there was a, a, a Merc issued as a coin in the 16th century. And, and, but but uh, in our display case, we've got here um, a very similar gold noble of Edward of England, Edward III. It's the same in almost every respect, except that it's got David in the ship. And it's got the Scottish uh, lion rampant on his shield. It's very hard to see here. Um, I'll try and indicate it for you. There. So, anyway, that's why. But he couldn't pay, basically. Edward said, all right, we'll cancel the debt if you make me your heir or one of my sons. The Scottish Parliament said, no. And so he, uh, he was at liberty in Scotland, but the debt was never fully met. Those are the coins we have in our, in, in, uh, in, uh, in our display. There's a penny, a half groat, and a groat. That's a tuppence, that's a fourpence, basically. And then there's just one more king, and this one's more straightforward, so it won't take me very long. As you see, he was pretty much roughly a com contemporary of, of uh, David, but uh, he, he ruled longer. He was known as Jean Le Bon, or John the Good. And there's uh, an image of him from uh, around 1350. He also was uh, married young. Thirteen's a bit young, isn't it? But his wife was pretty young too, but they managed to have 11 children in 11 years. 
Um, and uh, but anyway, the main issue here was the Hundred Years' War. And it was basically started when Edward III said, I've got a, 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 a better claim to the throne of France than the guy that you've put there. And so the Hundred Years' War started basically because of that and because of constant disagreements between feudal France and royal France. Uh, and that is, uh, the Battle of Crecy happened in 1346 and then we got the Battle of Poitiers. And this is where the Black Prince comes in. You heard of him, Edward the Black Prince. He was the eldest son of Edward III. He was the one who took, took uh, Jean prisoner. So, and sent him to England. He also ended up in the Tower of London for a while. It took only three years to negotiate this treaty, though, much better than 11 years. Uh, but they agreed on. France had to give up all this area back to England. As you see, that's huge. Three million crowns, they said. Well, that was the English term. But three million of them is an awful lot. And he had to leave his son Louis in the custody of the English as a surety that he would pay his ransom. Well, here we go. This is the, the coin that the English called a crown, but was really called, in French, called an écu or shield. There's the shield, and you can see the fleur de lis on it. Three million of those. And we've got one there in the display. And uh, now that that's a not that's an inaccurate amount too. I'm sorry. Uh, the real amount was nine hundred and sixty million dollars Australian. Nine hundred and sixty million. Well, France had already been demoralised by its defeat in the in the in the battle. And uh, it had already been taxed to the limit, so Jean couldn't actually meet the payment in 1363. And at the same time, he heard that his son Louis had escaped from the custody of the English. And so he felt that the only honourable thing to do as a knight and a king with a treaty that's been agreed to is to go back to England where he died in captivity with the dead unpaid. So, but he minted some beautiful gold coins, all of which probably would have been used for the ransom. There's the mouton, well that's the paschal lamb. Sheep. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. coins they are. The royal, or royal. Uh, and finally, the franc à cheval. The first franc ever issued, um, and it was known as a livre tournoi. There is the knight in his armour, on his horse, with its armour, and it's a fitting memorial to a medieval knight and king. And there's the acknowledgements. David did the photography and the calculations, and uh, there's, I've got a few books on the display there, and uh, they were really good, and some important catalogues. But look, thank you all for your attention and your patience. You've been wonderful, and uh, I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Thank you. Well, we've learned so much, Judith. Uh, <coughs> when we hear about these enormous amounts of money, uh, very touched. The medal, of course, is not of that value, but it's of <laughs> unique because it has your name on it oh. and is therefore priceless. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. And thank you, David, as well. <coughs> I shall just hand out some voting cards. Yes, please do. Um, colleagues, um, two of our colleagues uh, who have displays for the competition. Um, uh, have not given papers about their display. So um, our president and convener, 
have uh, uh, allotted five minutes each for them to say a few words. So first we'll ask Rudy Belmack if you would speak to us for five minutes or so, Rudy, to your display. Thank you. I'm, I'm speaking this afternoon in lieu of Darren Burgess of Melbourne, who, because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, cannot make it here. At relatively short notice, I've put together something, and that stuff over there. Um, uh, it's not really intended to participate in the display competition fundamentally, so don't don't pay too much attention to it other than to just get a sense of what's there in readiness for the talk this afternoon. My fundamental purpose is, uh, in general, my position in numismatics in terms of uh, uh, outlook, is that I see numismatics as being a department of sculpture. It fits into a larger picture and it certainly um, became that from the Renaissance onwards, one. Secondly, as a part of sculpture, it's a larger part of art and art lives in culture our culture, and that the history of art and the history of culture then become an issue... Could I get you to move over oh, we'll, a little we'll, bit? We'll just put that over there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Become an issue that, that I think it's <coughs> worthy of concern by numismatists as well. The history of culture fits into the larger history and that, that we've, uh, uh, certainly me, I feel, have been blessed by the historical vision uh, that the conference has offered to me this weekend. Now, if we're talking about history of art, the history of sculpture, then we're talking about phenomena which have expressive potency. Right? There's a distinction between any of the medals or coins that we see here and the pebble of the same size down in, in the stream, down in the river. This expressive potency, which is also revelatory of humanity, let's say, that it's not my, my purpose this afternoon is to try to encourage that, that you know, larger vision insofar as you know, others may not choose it, as it were. But, but I, I think that it's worthy of attention, and I think uh, I certainly have found it to be extending and enriching for my involvement with, with numismatics. Um, and just, just one extra point. To do uh, the way that I talk about it is that it requires me to, as it were, read what the expressive potency of the artwork actually uh, contains. It's interpretive. I'm trying to make sense out of the things. You know, these medals come and after a while you, you start wondering about what have I got in my hand. So, um, uh, that's a, so please look at it and, and even if you could keep in mind that sort of the great knowledgeable theoretician and historian of numismatics um, is uh, Sir George Hill of the British Museum. Um, I just want to note certain work that he's been done because I think that it bears upon um, uh, the work by Bertram McKennell, who I'll talk to this afternoon. Thanks. Really, just stay here a second. Um, Really, it's your passion for uh, the Medal of Star is coming through to us all. Really, I think all, many of us have experienced a moment almost of epiphany when we've suddenly come across a great statue or, or, or something. I remember I had an experience when I was in the Louvre once and saw the, the victory of Samothrace, La Victoire de Samothrace. Mm -hmm. It was just, I just came across it suddenly and there it was. It's a, 
it's a wonderful thing. Well, there it? we are. We have no lesser a numismatic authority <laughs> as, as uh, our patron. Yeah. Now, Rudy, <coughs> us the significance of it, you know, is open. That's all I can say. Rudy's uh, uh, display here actually is part of a formal competition. Would anybody like to ask or any points or make any points with Rudy? If not Rudy, well, thank you for that. That's it. And uh, I'd now like to ask um, to invite uh, Phil Benjamin, who has spoken about another subject, of course, but uh, Phil has uh, a, a display here today uh, which wasn't covered in his talk, and he'll be speaking to that now for the next five minutes. Placo Musophily. <laughs> the people from uh, Brisbane. Uh, familiar with this? Oh yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> A collection, Placo, the plate, <coughs> Muso, the muzzles that hold the plates on the top of the bottles, the wires, so Placo Musophily, the plate, the round metal plate located at the top of the cork of an effervescent drink, champagne, sparkling wine, beer, cremant, etc. So we have the plate and the muzzle that holds it there. The popularity of this collecting has had the status of plates moved from being a simple mark of recognition to that of an object of promotion, even becoming a true work of art. There are a new number of reference works to gauge the rating of a plate. Several magazines have been produced on specialised types of collections. Transactions and exchanges are also widely practised on the internet, but the only true old and rare plates of value can bring hundreds and hundreds of dollars. History. Champagne plate has been known since July 5, 1844, when a patent at the Ministry of Agriculture in France was filled by Adolphe Jacquesson a trader at Chalon en Champagne, I hope that's right, to ensure a better seal which previously had just been held over by a piece of hemp string. The invention consisted of a tin plate held tight by twisted wires. The impression of the word champagne appeared on these plates at the beginning of the 20th century. Subsequently, they became advertising vehicles for brands and the term Placo Musophily was made by Claude Malliard at Virtus in 1980. Virtus, a village in the Côte de Blanc, was awarded the first Placo Musophilia collectors meeting in 1989. Since then, it's organised every year on November the 11th, and Virtus is called the capital of the Champagne capsule. Next slide. Here's some of those capsules. Now, the one I have by and large collected only those which I or my family have drunk. <laughs> <laughs> People have lots of different collections. Now, it's interesting that um, that one uh, in the middle lower, I mean, you recognise some of the others. That was the Tattager official champagne to the 2018 FIFA World Club Cup. Next slide. What people have done with the wires? <laughs> it's incredible. There are some very versatile, talented people. Is there another slide? Look, <laughs> <laughs> rugby. At the bottom. And that's all I'd like to say, except, of course, last night we went for dinner and I convinced the girl behind the bar, the barmaid, to collect caps, wine caps for me, the Stelvin wine tops that are an Australian invention, and they fit into a $10 Kmart frame which has the exact right depth of 1.5 centimetres to be able to put them all in. <laughs> <laughs> Just something different. 
<laughs> Any points or questions to fill? I just want to add a point that, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, Professor Roger Scranton recently passed away and was a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a big metaphysics professor in Oxford. Um, but he wrote an important book with an eye-catching title, I Drink, Therefore I Am. <laughs> this, this is uh, something that could be included Thank you, in consideration of your work. <laughs> well, this, this is a, a collection for those with a thirst. <laughs> Can that be regarded as liquid assets? <laughs> well, they're expensive uh, presents for somebody. Each one represents 15 bucks worth. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Phil. Now, colleagues, uh, the time has come now for us all to be judges of these beautiful displays that are here. We're going to break and ask you to um, uh, indicate your preference on the voting slip that um, uh, Rod has kindly handed out. Put them in the cup. Put, yes, Put your vote in the cup. And the cup will be here on the table. I'm here on the table. Uh, how wonderfully democratic. Rod, should we allow 15 minutes for this? this? Yeah. So could we reconvene here? in 15 minutes. We're going to have the quiz before lunch today, a change in the program. So, um, uh, so we'll do that now and reconvene in 15 minutes.